Namaste, everyone. What brings us together today is our concern for India, where democracy is failing, minority rights, particularly Muslim rights, are in grave jeopardy, and the country is on a fast track to becoming a Hindutva Rashtra. My organization, Hindus for Human Rights, exists in order to mobilize Hindus to speak for the human rights of all, to lift up the inclusive values at the heart of Hinduism, to oppose and entirely reject caste and caste discrimination, and to advocate for the secular democracy enshrined in India's constitution. We do this work tirelessly, facing daily attacks from our own Hindu community who see us as anti-Indian and anti-Hindu, and from so-called progressives who see us as part of the problem simply because we identify as Hindu, which is the only thing we can identify as since that is what we are. We are fighting for India to remain a secular state. And I mean secular with the sense of freedom of religion and diversity of religion. I feel immensely proud that the founders of India did not create a religious state and we want to keep it that way. What are the rights that a secular democracy guarantees? Well, from India's own constitution, the freedom to justice, social, economic, and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, equality of status and opportunity, and to promote among them all fraternity, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation. But as we fight for India's democracy, we absolutely must also speak up for minority rights elsewhere, and at least the ideal of secular democracy everywhere in the world. If we do not, is this not an inconsistency on our part? What do we say to a Hindu Indian who says to us, if Afghanistan is not only a Muslim Rashtra, but one run by the Taliban, why should India not be a Hindu Rashtra? The reality today is that we live in a globalized world and what happens in our Muslim majority neighboring countries cannot just be ignored in India because ignoring it feeds the what aboutery of the Hindu right that justifies their violence against Muslims, at least in their minds. But addressing it isn't easy either because just as all Hindus aren't responsible for the atrocities of the Hindutva regime, all Muslims aren't responsible for the atrocities of Islamists. And this nuance can get so easily lost or misunderstood. I'm a practicing Hindu, but not a religious expert or scholar. The Hinduism I know is from lived experience, from what my parents taught me and what I in turn taught my kids. And my Hinduism bears no resemblance to the extreme, extremist, hateful and violent interpretation of Hinduism, Hindutva, that is decimating everything I love about the country where both I and my faith were born. I'm also not an expert in Islam, but there's an intimate understanding when you live and work closely with people from another faith or community. I've been en engaged for 20 years in human rights work in Afghanistan. My organization, my other organization, Women for Afghan Women, has been operating within an Islamic country where Sharia is the law of the land and saving the lives of women and girls being brutalized in their families and communities. And my Muslim friends are clear that the Sharia law practiced by the Taliban of the 1990s is not the Sharia law they observe. My organization has a two decade track record of working sincerely and steadfastly, respecting the faith and traditions of the Afghan people. All our 1200 staff are Afghans, half of them men and half women. And almost every one of them will say when asked why they risk their lives for the rights of women and girls, it is my duty as a Muslim. Indeed, it is precisely the inspiration of my brave Afghan colleagues that led me to ask, what kind of Hindu am I? And embark on this path of living out loud a progressive and inclusive Hinduism that has love at its core. 
I often hear Muslims, including Imams say that non-Muslims are equal to Muslims and must not be persecuted and should be treated with respect, care and love. In fact, I've never met a Muslim who says anything different. Today in Women for Afghan Women, we are trying to figure out what women's rights work, if any, is possible in Afghanistan now that the Taliban are the new government. I am terribly worried for Afghan women, of course, but also for the despised Hazara community in Afghanistan and the tiny Hindu and Sikh population that remains in Afghanistan and is in grave danger. The turmoil in Afghanistan since August 15th, when the Taliban achieved a complete military takeover of the country has devastated me, but has also renewed my commitment to advocating for secular democracy in India and the world. While India is hurtling towards becoming a religious autocracy, there is still some time for us to fight for the Indian constitution and democracy. All is not lost, at least not yet. It is imperative that we as Hindus and Muslims refuse to be divided and stand with each other, stand for each other in each other's hour of need. And we do. That's why I'm here today and committed to solidarity with Muslim Indians who are facing the most existential threat in Modi's India. And it's also why so many of my Muslim friends offered solidarity and generous support when the Hindu American Foundation sued two of us in Hindus for Human Rights, along with three other anti-Hindutva advocates, including brother Rashid Ahmed of Indian American Muslim Council, who most of you know, for alleged defamation, when really it is because we are speaking up for a pluralistic India. And in recent days, I have been deeply moved to see Muslim organizations and community leaders publicly denounce the spate of anti-Hindu violence spiking in Bangladesh. I will ask the organizers to post the link in chat to the sign-on statements Hindus for Human Rights has drafted and invite each one of you to sign. I am heartbroken when my Indian Muslim friends tell me that they used to have large and diverse social networks and many Hindu friends, and in recent decade, they don't know where their Hindu friends stand politically or where still they do know, and it's not good. And in the Hindu community, people, and I know this, people have swallowed a terrible story that Muslims are their enemy and the enemy of India. The levels of mistrust are astonishing. I've been thinking a lot about what we can do. And I believe we need to deepen our interfaith work. Hindu Muslim unity cannot just be a phrase. It must be a way of life for us. Let us make it a point to build and rebuild bonds with each other and replicate the India we remember and cherish. Let us remind, let us invite each other to our festivals and celebrations and allow our kids to be close. Let us do this in our private lives and in our organizations. You have done this today by inviting me here and asking me to bear my heart. Two years in a row, in fact, and this means the world to me. Such close bonds of love across differences are the lifeline of a secular democracy, which is what we enjoy here in America and what we are fighting for in India. The crux of my talk today is this. If we are fighting for secular democracy in India, we also need to advocate for secular democracy elsewhere. And since we mean secular in the Indian sense of religious and cultural pluralism, we need to do this advocacy together, refusing to be divided. Almost a year ago, my friend and Hindus for Human Rights advisory board member Fezal Khan, the national convener of interfaith peace movement dating back to the 1920s Kudai Kitmatgar, was in jail for 52 days. His crime? He offered namaz inside a Hindu temple and photographs of Fezal Bhai praying went viral on social media. The priest of the temple had actually invited Fezal Bhai to pray inside the temple instead of going out to the street. But even if the priest hadn't invited him, 
Faisal Bhai did not deserve to go to jail for praying in a temple. There were those who wanted to kill Faisal Bhai just for praying inside a temple. Hindus for Human Rights organized a press conference at that time of Faisal Bhai's arrest. And while, and we were deeply involved in the debate surrounding this case. There were progressive Hindus and Muslims we were talking to who felt that while of course Faisal Bhai did not belong in jail, he absolutely should not have prayed inside the temple. My religion teaches me that God is in every human, every atom of the universe. And the oldest Hindu scripture tells us, let noble thoughts come from all directions. The prayers of a devout man like Faisal Khan should be welcome in any place, any temple. Let us allow our minds and hearts to travel to a world where Faisal Bhai's prayers are welcome in any house of worship. We can create that world, you and I. The lowest point in my work in Afghanistan was the brutal lynching of a woman in Kabul called Farkunda. She was lynched in 2015 at a spot where I had stood just a week before her death, outside the Shaido Shamshira Mosque, right by the dusty and completely dry Kabul River riverbed. She was accused of burning Quran, and this was later proven to be a false accusation. For this, she was pummeled and beaten to death by a flash mob of young men. They used fists, and sticks and rods and beat her till she was dead. And this lynching was captured on so many cell phones and was shared widely with relish. When she was fully dead, she was run over by a car and her corpse was thrown onto that dry riverbed. It turns out that Farkunda did not burn a Quran. Farkunda in fact was a religious student and budding scholar and was calling out some terrible corruption within the mosque as reported widely in the press after her death. For this, she paid with her life. But even if Farkunda had actually burned a holy Quran, and let me be clear, I don't support the, bur the burning of the Quran. I don't believe her punishment should have been a brutal mob lynching. Of course, none of us believe that. Let us think of another example, which will hit much closer to home since this is the reality in today's India. Hundreds upon hundreds of Muslims in India have been lynched by Hindu mobs on suspicion of slaughtering cows or eating beef, et cetera, et cetera, since Narendra Modi became prime minister. In most cases, the allegations are false. But what if a Muslim in India did eat beef or kill a cow? Even though many Hindus consider the cow to be our holy mother, should a Muslim or anyone for that matter pay with their life for slaughtering a cow or eating beef? Should they even be arrested? I say a resounding no. Whether in India, Afghanistan or the US, we advocate for the same human rights. We reject religious extremism and intolerance and champion the rule of law and the right to free expression. We've all been reading about the spate of terrible violence in Bangladesh targeting Hindus. This is an, ex an excerpt from a statement from my organization, Hindus for Human Rights. In recent days, Bangladeshi Hindus who comprise around 10% of the country's population have faced horrific violence. This violence broke out on October 15th after a photo went viral on social media showing a copy of the Holy Quran placed on the knee of a Hindu deity statue. In reaction, Muslim mobs across the country have attacked Hindu homes, shops, and temples. The Guardian reported that over 80 shrines set up for the festival of Durga Puja were attacked. In Rangpur district, a mob burned over 20 Indian homes. According to Am Amnesty International, seven people have been killed and hundreds have been injured. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that when the Indian capital was racked with anti-Muslim mob violence in February 2020, violence that took more than 50 lives, the Indian government was not only silent, but complicit. Whereas the Bangladesh prime minister and her government have taken swift and strong action against the rioters. 
A Hindu teenager, Paratosh Sarkar, is in jail right now for allegedly creating or sharing the Facebook post that started this whole crisis, the post showing the Holy Quran on the knee of a Hindu deity. It is impossible to know what is true, but this is the charge. Perhaps many of you would object to the Holy Quran being placed on the knee of a Hindu deity, and that is your absolute right. The question I am putting before us is, what should the punishment be? of this young teenager. My ideal shrine would include the holy books of all religions and Mahatma Gandhi's prayers always included verses from all religions. We live in the United States and believe in the first amendment. We don't approve of jailing any accused for hurting religious sentiments. Too many Muslims in India are being incarcerated and killed in India under all kinds of cooked up charges. In order for our advocacy for secular democracy in India to be robust, we must be consistent. We must call for justice everywhere we see it denied. Even if that teenager did share that Facebook post, if what he is accused of is true, my belief is that he doesn't belong in jail, not for a Facebook post. There is another story also circulating in the press alleging that a Muslim youth entered a temple and placed the Holy Quran on the thigh of a Hindu deity inside and took the photo that started the mayhem. I have no idea if there is any truth in this story either, but reading this in the news reminded me immediately of something that happened in 1949 when an idol of Lord Rama suddenly turned up inside the Babri Masjid in Ayodhya. And we all know the dreadful and violent history that unfolded as a result of that act. Let's go beyond the discussions of hate speech on social media, Facebook posts, disinformation, et cetera, et cetera, and go deeper together on a spiritual path of Hindu Muslim unity. Let us imagine that world of Hindu Muslim unity, a world where we Hindus and Muslims did not consider either a Lord Rama inside a mosque or a Holy Quran in a temple, an act of desecration. desecration. We can create that world, you and I. I conclude by quoting from section 295A of the Indian Penal Code. Whoever with deliberate and malicious intention of outraging the religious feelings of any class of citizens of India by words either spoken or written or by signs or by visible representations or otherwise insults or attempts to insult the religion or the religious beliefs of, of that class shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to three years or with a fine or with both. This law, which we inherited from our British colonizers, makes it possible for works of scholarship to be banned and pulped. Just think of Wendy Doniger's The Hindus, and before that, Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses, and A.K. Ramanujan's 300 Ramayanas. One problem with this, India's version of a blasphemy law, is that it has almost always applied to minorities and activists, but never to BJP or RSS politicians who continue to offend and incite with total impunity. But the bigger problem, in my opinion, is that India has a blasphemy law at all. The great Indian artist, M.F. Hussain, who painted, among many other things, depictions of Hindu deities, sometimes unclothed, was charged under this and other laws and was terribly harassed, his exhibitions attacked, and his life became so unbearable that he died in England under self-imposed exile. Should he have been mistreated and driven out of the country for exercising his artistic freedom of expression, guaranteed by the constitution? Especially when his life work showed that he had no animosity towards Hinduism. I, for one, love Hussein's depictions of Hindu goddesses. It doesn't bother me that they are sometimes nude because Hindu deities are often depicted nude. It doesn't bother me that he was a Muslim because my God considers all of us her children. But think of those Hindus 
who are offended by a Muslim painting a Hindu nude goddess. They have the right to their opinion, but should an artist be arrested, attacked, censored, in some cases killed? Surely not. If we stand opposed to section 295A of the Indian Penal Code, we must stand against blasphemy laws everywhere in the world. These blasphemy laws obstruct rights we consider sacrosanct living in a country like the United States, the right to express ourselves, to believe what we choose, to practice our religion, to express our, our dissent. If we want Anand Teltumde, Umar Khalid, Ishrat Jahan, and all the other prisoners of conscience languishing in Indian jails just for expressing their dissent against the current Indian government, we must advocate that all countries respect the right to dissent, to express oneself, even to offend. Think of Safura Zargar, who was pregnant when she was, when she was arrested. If someone offends us, we can say so. We can stop listening. We can turn off the channel. We can debate. We can even peacefully protest. But if the act of offending us becomes criminalized, we are on the slippery slope to religious or ideological autocracy and democracy is dead. Let us join together on a spiritual path of love, of oneness, of unity, of Ishwara Allah Tero Nam. This is the only way to a world where all humans can thrive. We can create that world, you and I. Thank you.